Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for choosing our session. Um, before we start, I just want to make sure you're aware that we're both recording this session and live streaming it um, so that anybody anywhere can watch if they choose to. So um, just wouldn't want to be doing that without you being aware. But part of, um, part of our work is modeling what we want students to do. So this is our documenting and sharing. So um, when this is all finished, we'll archive the video and the slide deck and uh, the video will be made available on my blog. Um, so, uh, by way of introduction, my name's Mark Carbone, and I'm thrilled to be uh, co-presenting this afternoon with Andrew Boronsky. Uh, Andrew's a secondary school teacher in the Waterloo Region District School Board. He is, um, in my view, an amazing uh, front runner. He's a, a learner, an experimenter, uh, and does some amazing things with the students in his class. Uh, he's also the CEO of uh, TEDx Kitchener Ed, and I've had the honor and privilege of working with Andrew in uh, two of the TEDx events that he's planned, and I'm also excited that number three is underway. So thanks for joining me, Andrew. Uh, and thanks for the opening time introduction. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce Mark here. Um, I can't I really take the whole session just talking about Mark's accomplishments, so uh, I'll narrow down and kind of see what some things are here. But uh, we're very fortunate to have him as the CIO of the Peer DSB. Um, he has some peers, the co chair for OSPAC, OSMOOC, uh, he's the ASMO director, he's the ECHO president. So I don't know Mark how Mark has any free time, uh, but he seems to manage to get all the time. So uh, very happy to be here presenting with him as well. Great, thanks. So what we wanted to share today was um, really a process that we've been moving through in our school board for the last uh, <coughs> roughly five years, where we've, like many school boards, been focusing on uh, digital learning and moving the agenda forward. But I think we've taken an approach where we've tackled things in multiple strands, and um, we've had some interesting results, and we're excited to share those with you today. So. Um, just by way of a little bit of background, um, in my role as CIO, of course, I'm in charge of everything to do with IT administratively and instructionally. And the design that we have in our school board allows for some instructional people to work right in the IT department. So I have a team of eight uh, curriculum staff that work with me uh, in different roles. We have a, uh, two consultants, one for elementary and secondary. We have a technology support teacher that um, supports us with system level projects. And I also have a group of digital literacy teachers that have a combo role uh, of some library work and some staff room coaching in the area of digital literacies. I have to say up front, um, that model is very important to me uh, because it means everything that we plan in our IT department has an instructional voice and the way we structure our committees, um, the way we do our teamwork, we always have uh, educators involved right in the process. And that's, uh, in my view, been very beneficial. Uh, I just wanted to mention, um, when the, the Technology for Learning Fund started, we did uh, purposely target uh, some of our money to, to start into the, what can mobile devices do, how is it connected to classroom practice, and sort of in parallel to some other work that was done, uh, we did initiate a number of projects where in those days people were essentially doing writing projects, but they were online. It was using uh, Windows uh, netbooks, in essence, as the hardware. Um, but it was a good foray into us in terms of changing teacher practice, moving from uh, paper to blogs and other collaborative uh, environments. It was a chance to start to experience um, that whole thing of real world audience and what collaboration might look like um, in the classroom. Um, I think that's probably all I'll say on the next slide. Um, about five years ago, we launched an action research project in Waterloo called Futures Forum Project. And uh, in this project, our goal was to think about how could we do things differently? How could we break down the walls of the traditional secondary school classroom and take a look at um, approaching things in a different way. So we modeled um, this project um, after a number of us had done some work with powerful learning practice. 
uh, on four core attributes. So the course we designed was uh, managed by one teacher. Uh, we put together two time slots. So initially, uh, one teacher was teaching the same group of students for the whole morning of a semester timetable. Uh, we bundled together three courses. Uh, what we started with was uh, a package in grade 10, so English, Civics, and Career, a full credit plus two half credits. And the teachers were delivering all three of those programs within that half day block. And this was bundled around the idea of what was driving our thinking was this notion of the four ends, anytime, anywhere, anyone, anything, learning. And so um, we um, had good support both from IT and our learning services program staff to really think out of the box on this. And what we ended up with was, first of all, a big decision was not doing this as a one classroom, one school project, but starting it in multiple schools at the same time. So for Waterloo, that essentially meant engaging one teacher in half of our high schools um, as our starting point. And so way into what might have been uh, the beginning of the process. Um, we purposely did not unfit um, these classes by scheduling them into labs. This part of our goal was to experiment with different kinds of mobile equipment. Remember winding the clock back, this was roughly about a year after iPads were on the scene. And so classrooms had uh, a few iPads, they had some Windows netbooks at the time. Uh, there weren't really Chromebooks at that, that point in time. But the idea was, if you were in, you got this mix of devices for roughly a third to a half of your class, and you got a wireless access point right in your room. And that was the beginning of our learning journey around what it is that we wanted to do with uh, changing teacher practice, looking at assessment, moving from paper to online. But also behind the scenes from an IT perspective, we have to be learners too. And so we were learning about our bandwidth requirements, what kind of support model um, was going to be needed, what kind of uptime we could achieve on our wireless network, what kinds of digital resources um, would we need to support these classrooms. I'll jump in too. So I had the pleasure to uh, meet one of the future former teachers um, starting about in the second year of course, which is probably about six years ago now, I would think. Um, it's been interesting watching the evolution uh, for session talks, which I like to ahead. Like, uh, we're going to be talking about one to one, the initial we got for now. Right now, all of our grade nine students in my school, all grade nine, grade ten students are given a Chromebook from the school board. Uh, it's theirs to keep for the four years of high school career, looks like. Um, but we want to use the history kind of look at the evolution. So for me, as a teacher, this program was a, a huge dramatic shift. Uh, we had a half set class of uh, netbooks about six years ago, and what we'll that looked like in our program. Uh, the Wi-Fi at the time it was a constant issue for us going the next six years, and we had things crash again, and dealing with these issues. Um, and it was really interesting for that evolution. Teachers doing that at different schools. We had this mandate to try and collaborate online. Sometimes it went really well, and if the Wi Fi was down, the Chromebooks or the Netflix were having issues, it caught up, created a lot of problems for us as teachers. And so that was kind of constant feedback. We're having a, a back and forth with IT to work through those issues together. Um, and the improvements we've seen have been phenomenal, where like, you know, we had like 15 or 20 devices in the Wi Fi and things were not working for us. And today, in my school, I'd say we have usually over 2,000 devices on our network, and they, they could all be on YouTube and that helps moms very soon. Uh, and what that looks like for us now. Uh, for me as a teacher, well, it was really interesting because of the, uh, it was huge for a change in teacher practice. And having those devices in the classroom, you know, like a one to two ratio, uh, allowed me to change how I looked at my classroom, how my students looked at the classroom. Uh, and what a lot of interesting change in teacher practice allowed me to teach collaborate class, uh, classes school to school, um, really changed what we're looking at and how we're doing it. Some of the um, thinking that was put into the project was around the SAMR model, and I'm, I'm sure some of you have at least heard of this if you're not uh, imminently familiar with it. Um, I want to make sure you understand this is really just a model. And when I, I think about the model and the different ways you can use technology, I think the biggest benefit of uh, considering things in the context of this model is it's actually about reflection and change of practice. And it's not really, well, I've moved through these four levels and I've arrived at the redefinition level, yay, I'm done. It's not that at all. It's really about how can I use technology and digital learning tools much more effectively. And so 
that's, um, uh, I think we found that this has been an interesting model. And it really fits a lot of current discussions in education around the importance of being recursive in your thinking and revisiting things. Because as you hone your practice, as new technologies come out, as new resources come out, you're constantly at play in the way you think about things as you hone your practice. So I just wanted to highlight um, a little bit about um, some of the core elements that we decided would be part of this program. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, things have shifted over time, we'll explain that a little bit. But initially, there was a big push to writing online, getting away from the paper model, getting into a shared environment. Um, at the time we started this project, it was pre-Google Apps, uh, pre-Microsoft Office 365, and so we were in a very traditional um, blogging environment using uh, WordPress solution at the time. Um, but we found some very interesting things happened out of that once students were exposed to this idea of real-world audience. There's some interesting things teachers were feeding back to us in terms of taking ownership for work, um, wanting to sort of up their game, if you would, in terms of uh, the amount of work, the quality of work, knowing that it's displayed publicly uh, in an online environment. Uh, of course, also focused on uh, content creation, and we all know great learning is not simply about the content creation, but when you put it in the context of inquiry-based learning, research, uh, collaborating, and the end result is something that uh, you created, I think that, that's where there's a passion uh, point. Uh, we also did um, put into play what we sort of dubbed the cross-school novel study. So as I mentioned, the first iteration of this, we had seven teachers, one in each of seven different schools. And in this model, the seven teachers agreed that they would each teach a different novel. And so a student in my class could sign up to study the novel that Andrew was teaching, and vice versa. And we used at that time Adobe Connect as a video conferencing system to allow the teachers and students to interact across, um, across the, the county. So if you think back to that little diagram I showed about the blocking, in order to facilitate that, the schools did make an agreement that they would timetable initially everything in the morning and made that part at least easy. Um, and the last part was, um, and actually this is a nice lead from the, the last session I was at, um, we did put a requirement in of um, staff and students had to use social media as part of this program. And at that time, I'd say this probably was two dominant things that happened. One, a lot of teachers created a Facebook page. In other words, it was like a simple public website, no access to personal information. And those became forums where students could ask questions, students could help each other, teachers could give hints, they could post resources. And so that became a nice way of showing a very positive use of a social media tool. And probably the thing that lives on most today is um, what became known as TED Talk Fridays. On TED Talk Fridays, the teachers uh, all agreed on showing a common TED Talk to the seven different classes, and the students would actually share their learning uh, through Twitter. So all the students had their own personal accounts on Twitter. We used a common hashtag, um, I think both by school and one for the, our entire board. And so there was ways to sort of slice and dice the student learnings, the student comments, and um, that, that became very interesting because what we discovered through that process was that a lot of students that would not feel comfortable in putting their hand up in class and engaging in conversation were now involved. We also discovered that students that were reflective thinkers that liked to take some time before they posed a question or shared a perspective might go back and add to the stream after the class was over. And so that was a really interesting learning for us, just in terms of um, bringing some of those elements to a different life. Did you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I can jump here too. And so it was really just based, and hopefully a lot of this sounds very normal to a lot of us now. This is kind of what hopefully a lot of us are doing in our classrooms. But like six, five, six, seven years ago, it was a really interesting space where uh, this is kind of something we were just kind of in playing with. Um, as a teacher, it was really great to have the direction from administration coming above from our IT department kind of say, we want you to experiment, we want you to play, uh, we want to see what it goes, we want feedback from you, what works, what doesn't work, what are your pain points, what are your successes. Uh, we found a lot of interesting things that way, and Mark and I had a lot of arrow range for us. 
um, but kind of jumping into that online space and looking at the tools that are since there and how that changed learning for us. Um, how we grew performance for the talk what we were looking to do uh, was a really, really interesting space for us. And, uh, Again, I think there's a lot of that as we reflect back on now, as we do this presentation, think what life is like five, six, seven years ago to go around our classrooms now. Um, I think a lot of great learning came back of just kind of having a sandbox to have teachers and students to play in the space and try things out, uh, and then to work with our IT departments and our learning services and our consultants and kind of talk about this is where, what well, is what's really going on in class, this is what works for our students, this is what works for us as teachers. Uh, and having seen the people from above looking at, okay, this is where we kind of need to guide the direction to go, and this is kind of so in terms of what do we learn from this um, and what made a difference, one of the things that we really um, found through reflections as we move through multiple years and a gradual scaling up of this process, uh, the scaling up was Initially, this was a semester two project where semester one, basically, we did all the prep work to get the teachers ready to teach in this uh, new format. Um, the next year, we said, let's get all the schools involved. And I think the following year, we said, you can schedule as many sections of this uh, style of teaching as you want in the secondary schools and um, kind of move things forward. One of the things that actually made this project successful, though, was something we learned rather inadvertently through the reflection process. And that was the teachers that were in this were forced back into the learning mode. And not because teaching the course in this way was new, but because they were isolated. There was nobody else in the schools in the original part of this project actually teaching in this manner. And so it forced them to use the tools that the kids were using and force them to collaborate, and force them to coordinate in a different way. Whereas if I'm, for example, teaching across the hall from Andrew, it's pretty easy for us to meet in the staff room or grab a coffee after work, talk about what happens tomorrow. Well, when you're spread out into different schools, that becomes a game changer. But it was a game changer that's often viewed, I think, as a negative, but it turned out to be a huge positive. Was that part of your experience as well? Yeah, definitely. I, it just opened, literally opened doors for us. Um, it said, like, you know, you get to know your staff very well, your school, and the people you collaborate with, that's a very small, unique group. And for our students as well, I would say it was the same thing. It's like having your student body. Uh, in Kitchener, we have, as a part of the region, rather, we have 16 high schools, and geographically, we're not that far spread apart. You can just drive from one end to the other in 45 minutes, I would say. Um, but each school kind of has its own culture, its own dynamics, and so that was interesting for our students to connect that way too. For me being a current high school in Kitchener, uh, sometimes we connect with my students from Model Oxford, which is in the small town of Baden, um, and the culture of that school and those students and how they would look at it as the same issue to kind of share back and forth was really good for the students. And for us as teachers as well, uh, connecting with 10, 12 other teachers from different schools across the region, there's lots of good learning and sharing happening that way, which I wouldn't have gotten just kind of copying this after. In terms of, uh, of some challenges um, as, the, as the program started to scope up, um, principals started reporting back that timetabling multiple sections of this idea of teaching in the Futures Forum style became problematic because you're really bundling courses together in a rather unique way. And at least in those days, there was only a finite number of teachers that were wanting to put themselves out there into this space. So, and sometimes, the reality was, too, principals were faced with making what I would consider really tough choices. Do I promote something new that's part of changing practice? If doing that means maybe cutting some other course that you know, has other value in the school, then they've kind of got to weigh out the new versus the culture of the school that needs. And many of them commented that they had no problem supporting the new way, but there were sometimes some tough choices to make. And so, you know, at that point in time, I would say roughly the third or fourth year into the program, we're starting to see things veer in different directions. Uh, we also talked about um, the visibility of this program. So we tried to have regular uh, spaces where the teacher would come together face to face and share in addition to the other work we were doing. The most important thing, in my view, was people were watching. 
and they were watching to see what happened, how did this work, um, what were the impacts, what were the changes, and it started to gather a lot of interest, um, which was great. The challenge was, in the end, people would start to say, I'd like to teach in the Futures Forum style, where's the binder? Can you just give me all your notes and I'll read through it and just start doing it? And that's not what we wanted to have happen, because the other part was successful because teachers had gone through this process of learning, reflecting, putting new things into practice, teaching in a new way, and to just hand off the binder, you don't really get bring the same kind of context and experience to it. So we ended up actually breaking the teachers into um, differentiated groups so that the early adopters into this program continued on their own and we had different streams for different teachers to keep it fresh. And in that context, the goal was not to just mimic what other teachers had done, but to create your own version of the Futures Forum piece. So that, that really covers off the, the mixing it up. Um, one of the good things that happened uh, was schools started asking about other spin-offs. Well, did it have to be that course packaging? Could we do it with civics and history? Could we do it with English and history? Could we, could we, could we? And the fact that people were thinking about this in terms of growing it into new context, I think, is also uh, something that was uh, was very rich as we started to um, move it up through, through uh, different processes. So at this point, I'll uh, uh, invite Andrew to talk about uh, one of the unique projects that he was involved in. Sure, so can I highlight I think one of the things that came out of this project and having a technology in classroom is this encouragement to break down your classroom walls, not just be tied to the teacher and the 20 or 30 kids in your classroom, but connect in different ways. Um, and so the way this happens actually we're at a conference in London, this is uh, Alison Walker, who's a great four teacher where she works um, at the, the board level now as a kind of consultant role. But uh, we met at a conference, didn't really know each other, we were from the same board, we sat down and started chatting, and this is probably about three or four years ago now, just as our board had announced that we are going to switch over to Google Apps for Education, start entering that space, and we were both kind of geeking out and really excited about it, talking about, hey, like, all these cool opportunities are popping up with it, and it'd be great to connect in some way. And so, like, months later, we kind of came back to that conversation, said, well, what's some ways we can connect and collaborate? And so we both have some technology in the classroom. I had Chromebooks in my classroom at that time. She had a bunch of iPads in her classroom. And uh, led into this idea of having my grade 10 students mentor her grade 4 students for a big summer project. So for grade 4, their social sciences towards the end of the semester, uh, she decided that her students were going to build structures um, from different points in time of history that they had studied that year. And for my grade 10s, uh, for the 6th curriculum, uh, we had it set up so that they were going to have to take an active citizenship role and mentor her kids through it. So uh, digitally, we collaborated in a variety of ways. Um, we connected them in groups. My grade 10s actually had to map out how they were going through the whole process for them. So, for example, one group was going to build a uh, pyramid. And so, my grade 10s would go and do some research in the pyramid and kind of put in a, a template over four weeks of how they're going to build that, some research they might want to need, uh, some places to go and check out and kind of enhance uh, understanding. And that was a checkpoint for my guys to connect with them. So, they started Google Doc and shared with the grade fours and had some feedback and some sharing back and forth that way. Uh, that led later to Google Hangouts, where they were actually connecting online and talking to each other. Uh, the grade fours were having an iPad, showing them what their structure looks like right now. My grade tens in the live time giving them some feedback about how that works and what that looks like, and kind of some suggestions for where they can go. Um, another thing that became really important of this was that idea of an authentic audience for what you're doing actually has some real meaning and real value. For my grade tens, they knew that if they kind of dropped the ball, they weren't just hurting themselves or hurting these kids in grade four. And so um, we actually looked at the live class one time and like. Their game just raised up dramatically. It was the most engaged I'd ever seen them in class because it wasn't just an assignment that I was handing them that they could drop and recycle them away or remove from their drive from the trash can, but it was something that had real life meaning and value. So it's something engagement level go really up, um, and that was true for Allison's class as well. Uh, so, give me an example of that. Uh, Mark, you can click the spot. This is a link here. Uh, I just took a screen grab of one of these hangouts from my classes. So, uh, it's a great time in the live group. And I always forget that for Ali because it pulls this terrible screenshot of the start of the video here. So, sorry, Alice, if you're watching. Um, but uh, I just want to go to play there. Um, you can see my great time of live guys down here, and her great force can kind of show us what they can do with this project so far. And there she is. So 
nice or good jobs like that. And it was really interesting to have them kind of jump into the space. Like I said, one of the key things kind of takeaways for me was having that authentic audience, having a task that had really meaning and real value, and be able to connect with something outside your classroom, uh, changed the learning for my So they were so much more engaged. Uh, the time and effort they put into it uh, was dramatically improved, and the learning was dramatically improved because of that. Um, and it was an interesting space for us, because like, again, without the device or class, I, I'm much more focused on pedagogy than technology myself, but that technology really empowered my students to enter that space and have a very simple connection. So by just opening up their problem, sharing Google Doc, or they, had, they built websites for the great force to kind of interact with and kind of follow the process through. And so they had a lot of really interesting learning that came with having those devices and classroom access to those things. Um, and so that evolved for me in different ways too, kind of cut on the future's form. So in my three English classes, when I would talk about digital writing, having an authentic audience again. So what has it changed from just writing something on a piece of paper and Google Doc and sharing it with your teacher, versus having a live audience online. Uh, so in a three-year English class, uh, we did an all study where students had like a choice of one of ten different books to read. Uh, and we did across all our sections for our entire high school. So we had uh, four different sections, so about 120, 130 kids. Uh, working through these books, and instead of just being tied to that book themselves, we're just going to have a few kids in the class. Uh, they were sharing reflections through this blog uh, based on their text, uh, and we had kids from four different sections of our school, four different periods a day, checking in with each other, responding back, sharing their thinking about that book. And again, I saw a dramatic improvement in their writing just because I really truly believe it wasn't something I changed in their practice, it was just because they had that authentic audience. And it was, it was going online, and anyone could find it. You know, other peers from other classes were reading their responses. And they put so much more time and effort into what they were working on, their thoughts about it. They talked in class more, they had more questions for me. Uh, and the revision process, they went through and spent a lot more time on it because they were having an authentic audience again. Kind of having a digital space, and having your students have access to these tools, allowed them to connect in ways to see the thoughts and think of other students. They wouldn't have it had a chance to another space. So. Um, I across your classroom teachers. Some case, some nods. Uh, people play with Google Docs, so using Google Docs. Um, I like showing this example. You can see it's like going back to 2012. This is the first time I tried using Google Docs with a student in my classroom. Um, my practice has evolved a lot with it, but I, I just blew my mind this kind of shift in how technology could change my pedagogy. Um, as a teacher, as an English teacher, I would be getting students handwriting their work, they'd be handing it to me. I had scribbles all over the place, like, you know, arrow down here, kind of trying to write some comedy, like flip to the back of paper. By the time I got to my 20, 30th essay, my writing was looking less and less legible. Um, and I would see students, you know, kind of grab it, look at the mark, and they would dump it in the recycling bin in a class, and that would be the end of it. Um, or they would lose it, they'd never have access to it again. And so, so much has changed uh, in that process, in that cloud, kind of back and forth, in that formative space with my students. Uh, so, if I'm sitting a small piece of text, I can attach a comment to it. Um, that in itself is really interesting, because students can see the feedback so simply from me. But also, having this as a live doc that evolves over time. Um, if, if uh, question here, who's familiar with like, the C revision file, C revision history? Again, it's such a phenomenal tool. Uh, my process before this, I might say, have okay, you guys are writing three major paragraphs for the semester. So I'll do one at the start, one in the middle, one at the end. And so I would, they would write this paragraph, they spent all this time on it, I spent all this time marking, giving them feedback, and then I would leave it for two months. And they wouldn't think about the feedback, and they just kind of, like I said, in a third cycle again, they would walk away and be gone. And then I would come back, and I'd see their second piece of writing, and I'd pretty much get the same thing. And I would give them a bunch of feedback again, and then I would wait a couple months to get to summatives, and I would get a third piece of writing from them, and I would say, okay, you're still making the same mistakes, like, what's going on? Um, now, with this process here, and looking at that revision history, I, think it's, I can have them push this out as form of feedback, have them see the comments I've got them. It's tied exactly to where I want them onto the doc, and I can see if my students are using or not. Uh, they get those things like there's an option to resolve it, and they actually let me know. I get a notification saying this student said they've read this comment, they've gone, they fixed what, what they thought the problem was, and I get that feedback from them. And I can actually look at the evolution of the writing now and say, okay, this is where you started off, but now I can see, okay, how are you evolving? How are you making the changes that you need to make? Uh, and they can see that as well. And uh, I can share with the peer again that kind of same feedback as well. So while I'm really just doing the same thing I was before, many ways, the students doing some uh, creating a product, Heading into me, I'm giving them feedback on it, but now I have a much simpler, easier way to track are they actually using it or not. And again, from a student standpoint, uh, now that we've been doing this for three, four, five years in my school, uh, our grade nine students from four years ago, now in grade 12, and they're pulling up all their work and all their feedback from the teachers on the click of a button uh, for four years of the writing process. And that's been really transformative for our students as well, having those things in that space and having that digital portfolio presence there and having that access very simply to all their work and the feedback the teachers give through time. 
Um, so Mark, I'm going to kind of slide back to you here. So I mean, um, it was a Futures Forum was a fantastic project in so so many levels. Um, anecdotally, as a teacher, I can say I saw a great deal of improvement kind of following this process and entering this space with my students and the improvements I saw. But uh, we also dug down into some numbers with it too. So Mark, you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. So in terms of um, documenting our learning, we actually partnered up as a school board with uh, Pearson Ed to do some research for us. And we thought that was important that we got a third party involved and it wasn't just internal school board research. And um, so they, they actually did uh, research with us over a period of three years. And some interesting results. Uh, we actually, um, according to the results from um, teachers, students, and parents surveys, we had focus groups, and they also analyzed all the assessment data um, from those students. So this would be now multiple teachers, multiple schools, and different cohorts of students who were not tapped on the shoulder to be in this program. It was as they were timetabled. And we found that students that were taught in this manner, and I mean all of the elements that we're talking about, um, actually scored two to five percent higher in their final assessments than, than students that were effectively in traditional classrooms, in other words, in the control room. And so for us, this was a really, um, I think there's one other, yeah, one other slide here too. And so we saw shifts in, in student scores, we saw shifts in averages, and it was interesting that um, because we had started, I think, fairly broadly with um, the multiple school scenario, right away we were getting feedback that this was way beyond just whatever happened in one particular classroom. And so these ideas then became the building blocks for what comes next. So in terms of um, scaling up the what comes next was how can we build on this? And we started to talk about uh, the idea of uh, distribution of technology. Should we do more work in the space um, of sort of the future form style? Or should we be actually moving moving the agenda forward more towards one to one? And that's where the decision through our technology steering committee landed. And so we put a process in place where we actually had schools apply to be part of the pilot project. And we selected three schools. Uh, one was Andrew School here in Heights. Um, we also had Sir John A. McDonald and Jacob Custer Secondary School. And we were really looking at um, what did it take to move this forward? Again, um, as I said earlier, our IT departments need to learn. So this was now another step in sort of uh, scaling things up. And um, we're bringing more teachers into the fold and moving things forward. So, um, so we went through quite a selection process. Um, so we, we got to three schools, so roughly 20%. And we started to talk about we're actually going to have enough Chromebooks that every student gets one, what does that actually look like? And so we put a place in a model that we thought, if we're successful, we want this to be able to just roll and scale. So we ended up ordering uh, enough Chromebooks for all the grade nine students in those three schools. Um, we uh, pre um, sort of configured them to attach to our Wi-Fi, or roll them in our Google Docs environment so we can manage them centrally. And that was actually just a whole interesting thing to make sure they were ready for day one. There was no delays there. Uh, we had lots of dialogue with the schools around um, what did those logistics look like. And one thing that was interesting for me is when you work in a central role, you often can think about, well, we'll just do this across the system. But what we learned right away was, and I think important learning, is the schools wanted to manage the role in different ways. And so right off the bat, we said, no problem, let's differentiate. You can manage the rollout in a way that meets your, your own needs. So one school um, used a process where the kids got their Chromebooks on day one, but they actually came down in assembly, met their vice principal, handed in their paperwork, did a handshake, and, and took them back to class. Other schools um, sort of read um, distributed the Chromebooks and delivered them through a homeroom kind of a process, but still got them on the first day. The third school, um, they decided to take an approach where they wanted to um, sort of in-service more than, than the teachers involved in the grade nine program. So they ran a whole series of 
lunch and learns and a variety of different activities sort of between the start of the school and Thanksgiving, and then they roll the devices out five weeks into the semester. So three schools, three very, very different approaches. Um, Andrew, I thought it might be uh, appropriate for you to comment on sort of the kinds of activities that happened at the school level in terms of preparing the stuff since I know you were right in the thick of it. Yeah, sure. I just want to like, kind of speak and just kind of really highlight this too because I mean like, like sometimes that part is just is kind of normal for me so it skips over it. But like this evolution for me as a teacher, uh, like back in just form, like say five or six years ago, I was giving two iPads and 15 netbooks in my class, which was amazing at that time. And that evolved to, I'd say two or three years ago, I was almost one in one of my classrooms with Chromebooks. But even then, it was like the kids would come to my class, I had a cart in there that they would pull them out. They'd be out there for class, but then you would go back into the cart at the end of class. Uh, and then last year, September 2015, uh, the first day of school, every kid, every night, nice, there's almost 300 kids in our school on the first day is given a Chromebook saying, hey, this is yours, you keep it, you take it home with you. Uh, it's yours, you take it from class to class. Um, and it was incredibly transformative for our school in so many ways. And, um, from an equity standpoint, like, I felt bad sometimes because I knew I had some kids. Like, it was great that I had that full uh, cart in my classroom and when I was pushing stuff up through Google Docs, my class website. But I knew I had a few kids in my class who didn't have internet at home or have a device at home that they could access it with. And that was a concern for me as a teacher and how that played out. Uh, but knowing as an educator now, I can walk in my classroom and every kid has a device, a slide for board. It's the same for every single kid in my classroom. They have those with them and carry them with where they're going. Um, that's absolutely amazing and phenomenal. The other thing I really want to have this talking and prepping the staff was my thinking over the summer going into 2015, I was thinking about this. I was so focused on the students, how amazing this is for our students. You'll know, give everyone a device, a laptop, and say, This is yours, you keep it, you take it home with you. They kept it over the summer. Um, but the going through and working with our staff in these mobile ads, they almost more impressed in a lot of ways was the transformation one one had on our staff. Um, think about the, the all the things that can go against that idea of like incorporating technology classrooms. Can I book the computer lab this year? Can I get the car? Can I get the devices that can work that day? Is the Wi-Fi going to be up? Um, there's all these potential issues that could stop you from trying new and exciting things in your classroom. Um, and that this kind of took care of that for our staff. And so it really transformed what our teachers were doing in the classroom. And so as a group, we kind of took on this um, conference model from PD at the start, kind of saying, instead of us telling you what you should do or how this should look, that I give board a lot of credit, they kind of said, you guys, we're giving the kids devices, how you use them is up to you. We're not going to give you a thou shalt list that you must use Google Classroom, you must do this, you must do this. They trust the teacher said, they're there, your kids have devices in their class, see what you can do with them, how you want to use them. Um, and that really kind of sparks the creativity in your teachers, I would say. And so we took this unconference model from a PD standpoint of, what do you want to learn? And let's break off into groups, we're not going to say that you all, uh, the 98, 89 teachers here need to hear this one message. It's find out what works for you. We have like eight or nine sessions for people to go and check out. If you don't like that, go do something else. We had three people who want to work on something we're not talking about. Go play around with that and figure it out yourself. So we really empowered our staff and our teachers as well. And truly, without exaggeration, I would say it's transformed our school. Um, and there's phenomenal things our teachers doing. They, they want to experiment on. They want to try new things. Um, and it was really fascinating to me because that was my mindset. I was so focused on what this new for our students, but it really changed our staff in a lot of ways and the things that were happening. So kind of segue to what I was talking about that this idea of a shift in learning. So as a teacher, now if you know your kids always every kid in your school is going to have a device, and that's going to be the uh, setup for each day. Um, it allows you to start doing things that we've always talked about as educators, but we know are very difficult. Like looking at how you differentiate your lessons to your students. When you're doing pen and paper with your kids, it's really difficult to do. It's not that you can't, uh, but having every kid on the device, there's different things that push that out. Um, for our students, almost every, all our teachers at our school that would be mandated to decide to jump into Google Classroom. Um, that's great as a teacher for pushing things out and tracking things, but for our students as well, going to one dashboard and seeing all four of the classes there in the upcoming few days and how things are, having those automatically populated to a calendar for your assessments um, was really, really transformed for them in a lot of ways. And having that space, uh, collaboration really took off in our school uh, because kids could share very simply, teachers could share very simply. So our staff started sharing a lot more lesson plans, they have ideas together. It's that much simpler to go into that space. Um, and so it had, I, I, anecdotally, as I said, really, really transformed the impact on student learning in school. Um, and that connection between the two, if teachers are improving their pedagogy and trying new things, that's obviously going to trickle down for students and the experience they're in their classrooms as well. So 
would say anecdotally, you know, engagement was up. Uh, we had some really great feedback from the three schools who did it that end of year. And it was interesting. Going to that meeting, I was very concerned that because uh, I loved the project, that was great, but I thought it was going to be a chance because it was anonymous for a lot of users to kind of complain about the technology. And don't get me wrong, we had issues. If you have every kid on a device in a Chromebook, you're going to have some disengagement too. Okay, that kind of even Angry Birds is right there at the tip of your fingertips, and that's a good draw for our students as well. Uh, I would say it also kind of pushed our teachers to raise their game again too. Okay, we want these kids to have these devices to be on them. I better make sure my lesson is pretty engaging today because if it's not, they have a lot of opportunities to head elsewhere and kind of engage themselves in some other way. Um, and so looking at that feedback, I was a little concerned that there was going to be a lot of chance for people you know, at the end of the year. Um, I thought there was going to be a lot of expressions of frustrations, but almost like unanimously across the board and from three different schools, uh, teachers were so, so positive about having it. And you had the odd comment be like, okay, like sometimes the kids are a little distracted, but please keep this project going. We need this to keep going. I can't imagine, as like our teacher saying, I can't imagine going back to a space where the kids aren't one to one. Sir, um, and so I, I really like this idea of one, like looking at the one-to-one -one space equals three. Uh, it wasn't again. I hope kind of that's going to cross the message in here, but giving these kids these devices, letting them take them home, keep them over the summer. In my school this year, like really half of school has their own device. Our nines and tens now pull up to the grade nines this year, and the ones that had them last year have them again. And two years from now, literally, I can walk into my high school and every single student is going to have a problem at their fingertips they care about and it's theirs, they get to keep it. Um, it's been, I can't express how often it has been as a teacher. Has anyone else here in the is coming from a one-to-one -one space? That one other person? Um, is it for your school, to grade, or? Uh, the whole high school. The whole high school. The BYOD one-to-one. -one. Okay, so BYOD is for And that's another issue too, we haven't really talked too much about here, but uh, we practice BYOD for every two. Like I said, my first years, I had 15 netbooks in my classroom encouraging students to bring stuff in. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of positive BYOD from a finite need market speaking to the finance much more for how he's put a sustainable model to give every single kid a Chromebook and have that be our norm going ahead. Um, but I think BYD is fantastic, but it does raise some concerns about equity issues. So like, uh, if what kid has, kid has this device, and kid has this device, and how does that play out, and how do you manage it, and how does that kind of look at for you as a teacher in the practice? What can your expectations be of your students when they leave your classroom? Um, so again, having that one-to-one, -one, having them all on the same device. Uh, and there, you, again, you have some negative side too, saying you're all on a Chromebook versus something else. Um, but again, it's been just so, so positive for our staff and for our students. It's just been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and so like, I, I love this one because we talked about the like, teacher meeting and kind of have an idea of how it's transformed for our teachers. But I think it was from a meeting above too, saying not having given them thou shalt uh, and really encourage our teachers to go experiment in their classrooms, try things. Uh, it's okay if it doesn't work out. Uh, it was a new mentality for us as teachers as well. A lot of people feel like, you know, they're, that class must be perfect and things that your classes are never perfect. Um, but that, 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 that uh, illusion of control, like to say we're teaching that we're completely control of our class, uh, letting that go and trying different things was a huge shift for us as well. So having it and say, we want you guys to experiment, we want to try new things, we're here to support you. Um, that really changed the culture of our school. Um, so we, wanted, we took a, this is actually from last year, kind of during the first phase, where we're just piling this at our school from one to one. Uh, we have a couple of videos here, just other people kind of sharing their experiences in the space. Uh, so the first one here was my department head last year, Kyle Saka, with one of our students, just talking about how it changed practice in our classroom. So my name is Kyle Saka, and I teach grade nine English at Huron Heights, and I'm just going to say a little bit about um, how kind of the Chromebooks have changed our classroom something that we did all the time in our class um, and it, this is within the first few weeks of, the, of using the Chromebook. So um, in our program in grade 9 we read Q for Treason which is a very old book and <laughs> the kids laugh because uh, the copies that we give the kids have uh, duct tape holding them together and uh, sometimes they explode and they have things like that and uh, we, we found that we could get a copy of it in a PDF form online. So we have the kids, they have a hard copy of the book, but they also can access it through their Chromebook. And one day in class, this is Kayla, I'm <laughs> sorry, she didn't introduce her. And Kayla um, was listening and had her Chromebook. She had an earphone in and listening. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm listening to Cue for Treason. And so I was, stop everything. How are you doing this? So tell me what you did to uh, so get to it. What I did is, I took the PDF online and I copied and pasted it onto a Google Docs account and then there's like the read and write thing on it and it just kind of like press play and I like kind of 
credits. Mm -hmm. So I was so we sort of stopped the class and I said, how many people know about this? And they a lot of the kids had already figured it out, and I didn't even know about retrain at all. So it was uh, I was like, whoa, this is exciting. So we we got it, and I, I hooked my Chromebook up to the speakers in the in the class, and we we found out that you can have different accents on read and write. So then I said, well, this is a this is supposed to be a British kid. So we we put the British accent on it, and then we played it, and the kids were saying, oh yeah, I do that. And then, then we had this whole discussion about listening to cue for treason. And what can you tell them about what you said about listening and reading? Um, it actually helped me like understand the book a lot more because like especially since the book's like really old and kind of confusing and a little boring, so the thing is it made it a lot easier to like actually like put it into my mind and it made it easier to remember. Right. So I said, isn't that great? Because now we're you know reading, but you're listening as well. So you know, we're hitting at all these different ways of taking in information. So then I started thinking, well, that's sort of that idea of using it as a tool and making your job easier. So my next step, and Kayla doesn't know this yet, um, is we're going to use it for student writing. So they're about to start writing a formal paragraph, and because it works through Google, I'm going to have the students listen, they're going to write their paragraph, and then they're going to listen to their paragraphs before they submit it, because we find that I've always said to kids, you should read your writing out loud. Um, and this way, the computer or the, the Chromebook's going to do it for them. And they can listen. And especially if kids are having problems with doing punctuation, it reads to the punctuation, it reads to the periods. So they'll be able to hear, did that sentence make sense? And so before I ever get to evaluating it or giving feedback, it's another step that they have to utilize the Chromebook to, you know, to, to check their work, essentially. And then I'll we'll swap that one there. So say okay, one thing came on this was uh, and this kind of was really used to have the water staff. We had some reluctant staff to get it. Like, what does one woman look like? I'm not comfortable having to in my classroom. Uh, I'm not an expert in this space. Uh, we really talked about teachers being co-owners with their students and that open that space. So that was just a great example of that. Uh, just one student trying something, this teacher said, hey, what are you doing? Uh, and it had a lot of really interesting applications and kind of evolved in different things about how they use in the classroom. We found that over and over again. Students would find Google apps to add on to their extensions and uh, the Chrome Web Store. Teachers would find that we just kind of share it by word of mouth. And we kind of spread through the school like wildfire. Uh, like, you know, we find like, three or four students in my class who are trying out a tool to help them with their learning in one week, and then three weeks later, most of the classes usually are trying out. We go through the school that way and go through our staff that way. So it was a great idea of co learning kind of for the students and teachers as well. And kind of a lot of interesting um, organic being happening that way as well. Uh, so I want to play in just maybe one minute or so from this interview, if I can find the right spot. This is Ron DeBoer. He was the principal at Jacob Cusper Secondary School, which was one of our one-to-one -one pilot schools. And as we transitioned into all grade nights, having a one-to-one -one program, he's now stepped into a superintendent role. Um, but he was uh, kind enough to meet with me one afternoon this week. Yeah, we were um, chosen as a one-to-one -one Chromebook school last year at Jacob Esper. And um, it was just a fantastic learning experience for the whole school. And um, not just for the benefit of the students, because it was a game changer in terms of what we did uh, with our pilot schools, but it was an absolute game changer for what we did with teachers and, and just the power of, of changing teacher practice. Uh, the, the fact that students came to class, all 30 students came with a Chromebook in hand, uh, ready to use them, really changed the practice of the teachers and forced them to use those Chromebooks, uh, look, look for ways that uh, they could you know, help kids communicate better, think critically, all the, all the C's that we talked about. Um, we, we spent a lot of time with our staff preparing them for our one-to-one -one initiative. Uh, starting from the very, very beginning, we, we established a, a very, very good Chromebook team that uh, collaborated and figured out ways that we could help support our staff because we had staff all over the continuum uh, around the use of digital tools. We had students, we had staff that uh, were using them uh, all the time. We had staff that you know had never even picked up a Chromebook or, or a, an iPad, and so we we took a real 
holistic approach to our PEV with staff. And we kept looping back throughout the school year to the very beginning, supporting our teachers who are at the beginning of their continuum. And we didn't want them to feel like the school was moving along a continuum, and if they got left behind, that uh, they had no way of catching up. So we spent a lot of time as a group uh, planning our PD session, our, our staff meetings, our heads meetings, just building capacity with all of our staff, including lunch and learns on a regular basis that, that call on teachers to come in. And, and we've continued the, the narrative. If you still haven't figured out how to turn on a Chromebook, come to the session this February. We're six months into this thing, but that's okay. We're going to continue to restart and help people along on their journey. I'll stop it there. Um, it's a very good interview, and if you have time to listen to it uh, later, it's worth it because Ron's really got some very good insights into the differentiation needed to make teachers successful, and that's an important element rather than top down uh, PD. Um, we did want to uh, leave a couple of minutes for questions, but I'll just quickly um, let you know. Um, We've gotten a lot of positive feedback on the one to one, so I've provided some uh, video and newspaper clips that were put out. Um, our Futures Forum project, I've uh, got it captured in video in terms of describing it, and also some blog posts um, to talk about that, and some other videos that um, we recorded in chatting with teachers. So I don't know if you have uh, comments or questions, but uh, Andrew and myself would be happy to. Um, Answer anything that you have. Yes? Um, Mark, they uh, kids go in grade 10, so do they Chromebooks move with them to grade 10 and then continues on up to 12, or do they stop at 10, or how do you? So we, what we've done is, um, on the financial side, we've actually reached a point, um, and I'll, I'll say up front, we've been studying all the numbers for about three years. Sure. But we've actually reached a point in time where the cost of doing one-to-one -one Chromebooks phased in over four years with the grade nines is exactly the same cost as changing out all the labs, um, at least for the numbers of computers that we have. Like it's probably within a hundred thousand dollars would be being the same cost. And so, um, having reached that point, Andrew alluded earlier to the idea of a sustainable, sustainable model. So what we're doing right now is each grade nine gets the Chromebook. They keep it for four years and they charge it at home and it's their digital learning tool. Um, as we deploy a round of Chromebooks, at the end of that school year, we would pull the oldest lab out of the school. And so, for example, the state that here in Heights is at right now, they already have half of their students, all grade nines, all grade 10s, have the Chromebooks and they'll give up some lab equipment their older stuff, and so there's kind of this passing in the night piece, phasing it in over there. Yep, and we have allowed that we anticipate, um, of course, that there will be program needs beyond the Chromebooks. We don't see Chromebooks only, um, at least at this point in time, meeting all curriculum needs. So I have money dialed in so that in the end, each <coughs> secondary school would have roughly the equivalent of three labs. Um, and I just did a presentation uh, to our um, technology planning teams for schools uh, this week, encouraging them to think out of the box about what, what a lab actually might look like. I mean, maybe their carts or tubs full of iPads. Maybe they're, they may not be yes tops. That's what we've done in our we moved the tubs and Chromebooks in. And so we're trying to convince them labs aren't any type of ways. Yeah. yeah. So we have each school does a technology plan. And again, so it's not the same across the whole county. The dollar spender ratioed out on an FTE basis, but schools can customize the plans to be based on their own programming needs. Have you thought of giving them to the grade eights so that when they transition to nine, they have that learning environment that they can go into? We've had some informal conversations about that. Um, we're at a point right now, without changing the IT budgets, in, at least in the water, the context, um, that what we've done is absolutely sustainable. Um, most of our elementary schools are going through a process that I've dubbed the sliders model. So as they trade in their desktops, they take a mix of technology back, they can choose iPads or Chromebooks and how many of which, as long as the dollars are even. And so um, we're seeing, I would say those schools are probably roughly 60% Chromebooks, 40% iPads seems to be where the needles are pointing right now. And our goal was to get the whole board 80% mobile, 20% desktop, 
by the end of next year. Yeah. We're almost there, actually. And some schools have gone well beyond that just because they've used flexible dollars or fundraising money to push beyond. We actually have a couple of elementary schools that are almost one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. I would say a handful, maybe six to eight, that are maybe two-to-one ratios. When the sliders model plays out in full, those schools will be already down to about three and a half to one for a ratio. In the technology plans from this year, I think we had seven schools in the grade seven, eight range ask about doing one to one. So that's being looked at right now. Well, what's had the greatest impact? The Chromebooks one to one or the new model of teaching, which is the inquiry based year four C's? I think it's both. I don't think any, any one no, on its own. No, I think Andrew only. really described uh, some good scenarios where pedagogical piece would be. I would say there's symbiotic. I see like my school this last year we saw a huge teacher transformation right. it was because teachers knew the kids had the one-to-one -one and were to have the devices there and so now that kind of changes their thinking okay now i've got opportunities to do things in that classroom that wasn't an opportunity before yeah that's what i noticed in our place too since they just do the dogs and everything like that didn't change yeah. the dynamic changes completely yeah. absolutely i think teachers most teachers like the teachers care about students they want to do what's best for the classes um but we also only have so many hours in the day and uh so much time for our lives and so giving us some access to like, things like Google Apps education so you know your kids have Chromebooks um, allows you to move much more easily now. Yeah, so that's really been a big change of teaching I'd say. Very cool. Uh, my, my question has to do with a couple of logistical questions, really. Sure. Um, maybe three points, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, first, like our, our school has like two PC labs and we just have five cars full of computers. Batteries are always dead. Like kids don't charge them back. We have those annoyances. So one thing is retrofitting. They don't actually go home the night before they go to soccer. They don't charge the computer. Retrofitting a class and have plugs at every desk, or they're always in the corner charging, writing on the floor, which I had seen in my class. Um, the lifespan. I mean, even if you charge it, two years a battery lasts in a laptop. I mean, I've had multiple laptops that two years. After the four years, do the old laptops? They can't go. So the new vibrators will be obsolete by then, so they get donated and do like the cost. And we actually that. haven't figured that part out yet. Three years, right? Um, so four years is. Yeah, I mean, based on the testing that we've done, we've had a lot of Chromebooks that have made it four years, same yeah. with iPads. Um, and so we're yeah, anticipating that they'll, they'll make it through a four year period. Um, and what happens in four years, whether they're give backs or maybe an option to buy them out, is still being explored. And then after um, five years, they're no longer supported anyway from Google. So that's we're having to chuck them anyway. So, so we yeah. just have to formalize some kind of right. process. And I recognized in the interest of getting this whole project out the door, that part didn't have to be decided up front. <laughs> so let's not get hung up. <laughs> yeah, I would say that like, anything, like we had a lot of staff and students who were concerned with that idea, like are these actually going to last? Um, so I said like, I've had a cars of Chromebooks in my class that I was never seen in the classroom today. Um, four and a half years later, they're still in like, like the silver Samsung ones. Oh, we right have those. Yeah. yeah, and they're not like the Dell, we're on some black Dell ones now, which I would say are a lot more sturdier. And I think that again, I totally would say students when it's not their device are yanking out the car they're a little rougher with it. Now that it's, like, it's theirs, they take a lot of worship for it. They take great care of them. Um, it's been impressive that way. So I, I would expect we'll see most in last four years. Just before people go, I just want to, for those, especially for you three that came in later, this is me. <laughs> no, it's not a problem. We're glad you came. But we have been videotaping and live streaming. So if you look in the links at the end, we'll post the video and the slide that will be available on my blog. That's how we're sharing. So you think Khan is coming in? Um, I'll try to <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'd like to actually ask, to ask you a question about the, uh, the research that you did with regards to it and your choice of using a person as a, as a place to do the research. Uh, was there a particular conscious choice of using Pearson Education as your research collaborator? Um, I wasn't actually involved in that. Part of that decision making that was done by our superintendent group, um, but we did we do have our own small research group right within the school board. They did some research, but we also wanted to validate it by a doing a second body of research and being able to show that we were biasing the research in any way. I just wondered because as a publishing company, um, well, 
was there a was there a benefit for for the school board to do that? No, it was more of a consulting thing, and I don't think any of this stuff actually is out in any books anywhere. We may not share those two slides, but there's an internal board document about that. So the other question that comes back to the environmental sustainability of, uh, of the amount of Chromebooks at the end of four years, or so, uh, so that that regifting, or how is that going to be? You said you haven't made a decision of how that's going to be. Uh, but is there a consideration around that, I guess, environmental component to it? Well, um, when you buy technology, of course, we all have to pay the disposal yeah. fees um, up front. Um, we would never encourage them to be um, used in other than a responsible way. Um, but we do recognize that technology also changes, as has been alluded to. The, I think one of the benefits about Chromebooks, from my view, is because it's less dependent on the hardware, it's all about the browser. I mean, if the battery lasts, and or if you're having to use them plugged in, it'll probably actually last longer than four years. Uh, so that's a bonus. It's not tied to RAM and CP processing power and all that stuff as much as some other technologies are. So I would see potentially being able to extend the life, which we actually thought was a, a benefit. No, I certainly, I asked you this, these two questions that are a little bit more challenging maybe, but certainly the pedagogical advantages and, and what you've seen in terms of teacher development and teacher collaboration is incredibly strong. Like the way that you speak passionately about what, how you've learned as, as teachers and as um, staff members in the school, it's, it's powerful to hear. So. Okay, I get the environmental question too, and it's the flip side, when we start paying those for schools too, so we're like, uh, flip cards would be like, we're saving a ton of trees this way, yeah. but I agree with the disposing technologies and environmental uh, question too, that's well, worth asking, absolutely. Sometimes it's been said, let's send it elsewhere, which again, creates an issue elsewhere. Sure. Mark, one of the things we did with our kids, at the same time as we were rolling away, we had a similar problem, we got all the, the one-to-one, -one. Uh, but we rolled it up to our CEO. You know, we changed a lot of the SIA technology from Windows laptops and iPads and a variety of stuff to Chromebooks. And as we have more Chromebooks in our classroom, we found the SIA kids were actually no longer ostracized and they were joining in the class a little bit better. And that was a, a sort of an unintended benefit of going to that to program. Right. And we've actually been finding the same thing. We oh, just yeah? really did our first big switch last year with that group. Okay. And uh, we've been having the same very positive yes. feedback. In fact, some of the students um, that had the clunkier Windows laptops asked if they could freeze them early to get Chromebooks. So, some of them actually threw them. We tried to accommodate them. Um, yeah. And they, you're right. They, they feel like there's a, a better the class. class. Yeah. Absolutely. It's been positive. Well, thanks again for coming. If you um, want to get in touch, um, check out the links. You know where to find us online. We're both active on blogging and Twitter and any other way you can track us. Thanks, thanks.